<clears throat> All right. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's presentation with Ann Perkins of Headacre Farm in Owls Head, Maine. And her presentation tonight is titled Gardens of Use and Delight. I'm Brenda Harrington, Program Librarian at the Belfast Free Library, and we've been pleased to continue to co-sponsor the Winter Evening Lecture Series with the Belfast Garden Club this winter, now that it's spring, <laughs> and glad we have been able to do so remotely. Um, thank you all for joining us. Before I introduce tonight's speaker, I'm going to turn the mic over to Margaret Campbell from the Belfast Garden Club for some updates. Margaret? You're muted, Margaret. Sorry. Thank you, Brenda. <laughs> and thank you to the Belfast Library and Brenda for hosting our uh, programs. Um, in April, Monarchs, Milkweed, and Migration by Cyrene Slagona on April 20th at noon. To register for that, um, go to our website at Belfast. Uh, gardenclub.org. Okay, thank you. Brenda? All right, great. Thank you, Margaret. And thank the Garden Club as well for all that you do to keep Belfast beautiful. Um, I want to remind everyone again to please keep your mics muted. Um, there will be a Q&A after the talk and during the talk we will um, we ask you to just type your questions in the chat box and at the end Corliss Davis from the Garden Club will read them to Anne. Um, and also, I don't remember if I said this, tonight's program is being recorded and it will be uploaded to the Belfast Library YouTube channel um, right away and eventually I'll get it on the website. Our speaker tonight, Ann Perkins, has been gardening since the age of four and has left a trail of gardens behind her as she has moved, including in Florida and Alaska. She settled back in Maine since 2001 and is now able to devote herself to full-time gardening and is enjoying every minute of it. And I'm sure we'll be able to see that in this beautiful presentation tonight. So Anne, please unmute yourself and it's all yours. Well, great, thank you very much. Um, I'm really glad to be here. Good evening to everyone. And I, I think I talk for safe, I speak for everyone when I say, isn't it glad that, aren't we glad that spring is in the air? And I hope everyone's been out enjoying the weather these past few days, because I certainly was. I've been working on where my new uh, big garden is going to go in my house. And it's very exciting for me for this year. So tonight's talk is kind of a hodgepodge of information. I know last week's Belfast Garden Club talk should have given you beginning vegetable gardeners, some guidelines for establishing your new gardens. I might repeat some information, so bear with me if I do. During this talk, I hope to bring you some um, additional information, mostly aimed at experienced vegetable gardeners for you to use in your gardens. I'll take you on a little tour of Headacre Farm and use it as an introduction to garden planning and record keeping, uh, crop rotation, succession planting, companion planting, integrating annual and perennial flowers and herbs into your vegetable gardens and cover cropping. Now, I only have enough time to brush over a lot of these topics, but hopefully it'll pique your interest and then you can do some more research or contact me for more information. And I'm going to apologize in advance if my dog Horatio decides to bark very loudly, which he does at just about everything. So since the summer of 2010, I've been farming at Headacre Farm, which is owned by my friend, Carrie Altiero, who owns Cafe Miranda. So I lease part of his property from him and he buys many of my vegetables, flowers, and herbs. This is a great old aerial view of the farm so you can see how wonderfully we're situated. The farm's located down a dirt road in Owl's Head and it's perfectly sited on the south slope of Ingram Hill in a wonderful microclimate. The land catches the sun, drains beautifully because it's on a slight incline and it has the tempering influence of the bay. So that big area below the white and green buildings is where the, the, we established the farm beds. So you can see it's a pretty big area. So 
I started out with that big grassy field. You can see the white chicken barn in the corner there and Carrie's tractor. So over the years, I've expanded the beds to an area of over 20,000 square feet, which includes pathways. But this year I'm reducing it by half back to the original 10,000 square feet because I won't have a crew. So I'm gonna concentrate this year on the main core of beds, which you'll see. So here's a map of the beds. Um, and it's, there's, it's hard to do a vertical thing in, in Zoom so and in PowerPoint. So you can just imagine that the map on the right-hand side is attaches to the bottom. You can see that the growing area is about 80 feet wide and 130 feet long, and it's divided by a four foot center path. At the top of the two main sections, I established a rhubarb bed and a perennial herb bed. These two beds are four feet wide, and I also plant daffodils in them, which you'll see later on. Below these, the main garden contains permanent raised beds of various widths separated by permanent paths. So each side is approximately 37 feet wide and each is a mirror of the other separated by the main path. The top four beds in each section, which you can see there A1 through four and B1 through four um, are four feet wide and separated by two foot paths. So I use these beds for crops that need a lot of room like pole beans, cucumbers on trellises, double rows of staked tomatoes, or Brussels sprouts, collards, and cabbages. Each of these beds has a different crop every year using my four-year rotation scheme. So the next 16 beds on each side in each section have 30-inch wide rows with 18-inch paths in between. These are actually two sections of eight beds a piece. As you can see, they're C, D, E, and F, and you can see the different colors and, and then bed numbers one through eight. Bottom of the main beds are four additional 30 inch wide rows. I originally intended these mostly for annual herbs, but I have strayed in the pursuit of more bed space. And finally at the bottom, you can see I and J, which are four additional beds. These each are three feet wide and were intended for cutting flowers, pumpkins, sunflowers, ornamental gourds, miniature pumpkins, but I'm lucky if I, dahlias, but I'm lucky if I get them planted every year. Uh, a couple of years ago, I decided I was going to redo it and we just have never caught up from that, only getting about half of them into uh, production. So having permanent raised beds allows me to use no-till methods mostly, and it concentrates the soil amendments and mulches where they are best used. Here you can see, the raised beds, some of them have um, mulch, uh, a good um, alfalfa organic mulch on top. The dark areas are the paths that are permanent and I covered them with newspaper and then topped them with bark mulch. And that makes it easy, that easy to keep them weed free. Having permanent beds and paths helps to minimize weeding. And since the beds are only cult cultivated four to six inches deep and the paths are covered by mulch, weeds don't have much of a chance to germinate. So over the years, the, my crews and I have managed to greatly reduce the weed seed load in the soil. And I think raised beds are labor saving too. Once tilled and shaped, they don't have to be reestablished every year. So they just need a little TLC cleaning up the edges and things like that. We use uh, twine and bed stakes to um, define the beds. And that also helps us. It's a visual reminder not to step in the raised beds, which as you know, will compact the soil. So I, one of the things, I think of the farm as being human scaled, which means me and my crew when I have one, do just, I do just about everything with hand tools. The only exception is when I cover crop and I use this fancy schmancy BCS walk behind tractor that I own, we call it the Italian stallion, to till in the cover crops in the spring if I sow an overwintering cover crop such as winter rye. So I use drip irrigation to water. And it's a system that directly delivers water to the surface of the garden beds, which saves water and reduces 
disease spread from soil splashing up on plant foliage. It's a pretty marvelously adaptable system. And depending on the size of the bed or the type of the crop in the bed, I can add or remove these tapes to control watering. So each section of bed has a separate supply line and I usually water two sections a day unless we're getting a lot of rain. Now, when the, when the tapes aren't charged, they're flat, as you can see on the tops of the beds. When you uh, turn the water on, they swell up and underneath each tape is a white line and every eight inches in that white line, that's just to tell you your visual where it is, is a little slit and the water drips out of there and soaks into the ground. Um, often the tapes are covered with mulch. Um, sometimes they're not, we move them around a little bit, but um, it's really great and it's definitely worth the investment and it's nothing like soaker hoses, which I struggled with for a number of years. So I grow just about every kind of vegetable and annual herb. I don't grow corn and I don't grow asparagus, but I will be growing asparagus here in my new garden. But I mix vegetables, herbs, and flowers in my bed, as you can see. Um, some crops are left to grow all summer long, like kale, chard, parsley, storage, onions, and pole beans. Others are planted in succession, which means I plant a new crop every two to four weeks. And I'll talk about these a little bit later in my talk. My season begins in February in my two seed houses where I start most of the seeds for transplant into the beds like the tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, lettuces, and onions. I start seeds all season long as it allows me to closely succession plant to maximize yield. These are great. I made these out of plastic and two by threes and two by fours and they're heated with the little buddy propane heaters as you can see on the bottom right. And you don't have to spend a lot of money on a greenhouse in order to start seeds effectively. These will can get up to, they have ventilations, uh, flaps and things like that and doors that open and close. So I can control the temperature pretty well. They can get up to 120 degrees in the daytime if I'm not careful. And that would of course kill most of the seedlings. So other seeds like Greens mixes, cilantro, radishes, carrots, turnips, parsnips, and beets, for example, are directly sown into the planting beds at the right time. Some of these are also planted in succession for continuous yield, as you'll see later on. By the beginning of April, I try to be working in the beds, and it all depends when the ground thaws. I work at the farm until late October, sowing cover crops, harvesting cold hardy plants as long as they're viable and planting next year's garlic crop. Then I put the farm to bed the first week or so in November. So the winter months are spent ordering, planting and ordering seeds, wrapping up the record keeping for the season and planning for next season. And in late February, early March, it all starts again. So here you can see on the lower right hand side are a number of greens mixes. Those are planted in succession. You can see the ones closest to the cabbages are smaller. And then these are harvested and then I let them grow again a couple of times. And then that allows me to have a continuous succession or, or continuous yield and harvest for sale at the farm. <clears throat> but you can see the cabbages are pretty big and now they're a longer season thing. So I wanna talk about record keeping. Now it can be as simple as complicated or as complicated as you want. I'm a recovering accountant. So my record keeping is pretty complicated because I love records and doing things and numbers and stuff like that. But it doesn't have to be. Most important thing is that you remember the important things and you write them down. So for those of you who want more complication, I hope to give a series of classes about record keeping and planning in the fall when it's the right time. Um, so hopefully some of you will be interested in that. So the first thing I do for each year is I make up this nifty growing season calculator. And if you look on down where that's highlighted in green, it gives you a month and a date. 
dates, so of a date of a week, and I arbitrarily used the Monday. So this is from last year. So I start thinking about stuff in February. So that's, you know, February 3rd, 10th, 17th, 24th, then again to March 2nd, 9th, 16th, you know, all the way down. Then you can see down under 413, I have a line that's typically when I can first plant at the farm and the ground should be sufficiently um, defrosted by then, unless we have a late season snowstorm. By then the next line down indicates when my last frost, frost is approximately at the farm. Everybody has a separate microclimate. So what is true in Owl's Head or Thomaston is not gonna be the same for somebody up in Union or Morrill or you know, even Belfast. So you have to keep that in mind. This is why it's important to keep records of temperatures and frosts and things like that. <clears throat> you can see up on the upper right hand side, I have a countdown for the weeks until the last frost. This is really important for keeping track of when you should start your seeds. So if you're in a seed catalog and it tells you eight weeks to start your um, calendula, eight weeks before, I'm just using this as an example, uh, eight weeks before last frost, you know that you're gonna wanna start your calendula the week of uh, March 23rd. That's a little early to start calendula, but that's the week I typically start tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant. Back up in February, I'll start my leeks and things like that. Then I have a calculator, this 7, 14, 21, 28. That helps me to do calculate days to maturity, not only for, for harvest and when things I should expect things to be right. Then for me as a market farmer, I think about when do I need to plan to have peak production? And usually that's a couple of weeks before 4th of July, when most of our summer residents come up to stay for the summer or the farmer's market starts. Although my farmer's market, we start the end of uh, the last week in May. Um, and then I know that usually after Labor Day, things die down a lot. So I plan to start cutting back then. And then the final line there is when I feel I can expect my first frost of the season. So if I'm trying to calculate, um, if I wanna plant basil, I have to know that, you know, the last time I can plant basil, if you look at it would be about, if you look at 70, uh, like, you know, you look down about uh, 70 on above that line for 10, 12, I have to start that basil about the end of um, July. Basil is another succession planting thing. So let's see. Uh, so pretty much I've, uh, I've explained how I use this. This really is the foundation. And these numbers on the left-hand side here, the dates will correspond to my planting maps, which you'll see in a minute. So back to the farm map. And you should absolutely make a map of your own garden. Um, one of the things that I do is, well, I make a map and I use it as a template and I just make photocopies and then I can scribble to my heart's delight on them. So, but maps help you remember what's been planted and where, where you've fertilized and amended and where you've planted perennial vegetables, herbs or flowers. They help you track your crop rotations. They help you plan your layout for the next year's garden and they help you determine how many plants you'll need given the amount of space you have in your needs. So for example, if I'm, uh, I use graph paper, um, they're really, maps are easy to make, especially when you have linear beds, which is typical of a vegetable garden. I use graph paper of different sizes, tape measures and a ruler, and each square on your graph should represent approximately a square foot of garden space. And I said to make a template, so I also number my beds, which makes them easy to keep track of. And you can still, this, still do this if you don't have permanent raised beds, just label each area of your garden and keep it consistent year to year. So the same size. So if you have a 20 by 20 foot garden and you break it into two 10 foot by 20 foot sections, make sure you have A and B, and then you can label because you don't want to mess up when we start talking about crop rotations. 
So the other thing I do is you'll see I have bed markers and they correspond to my bed uh, numbers. So, uh, you know, E3 or E4 will have a little big painted marker that says E4, so you can't screw up. I have screwed up by not putting markers into beds. So for planning, I do two things. First, I make an overall plan of what I'm going to plant in general in each section. So this lets me get my thoughts on paper. And I always refer to previous years when I'm doing this. So here are some overall bed plans for my crop rotations for last year so you can see the difference. In A, A and B are always the same. So A1 and B1 are mirrors of them. And when I get to crop rotations, uh, in these, in A and B, the rotations move a bed every year. So what's an A1 is gonna be an A4 this year. So that'll be where my uh, brassicas go and so on. It's a rolling and that'll be on both sides. And I said, this is where I use plant the larger plants. But you can see um, up on A1, the Brussels sprouts, I have eight feet, eight by four feet of Brussels sprouts. I plant Brussels sprouts 18 to 24 inches apart. So that lets me know how many plants I can cram in there. So you, you, know, you do the math and you figure it out. Um, so one of these things, I'll get, go into a little bit more detail going forward. So next thing I do is I make a detailed plan for each bed. So for example, this bed um, F6 um, is, I don't remember what I planted in here. Let's see, last year would have been, wouldn't have been tomatoes and peppers because they're in all. But anyway, so you can see that I've got 4.6, 4.13, 4 4.20. So each of those pictures of that bed tells what's gonna happen that, um, that week. So the week of 4.27, I'm going to direct seed uh, crop H in there in that part of the bed. And then I have lists of what H, and you don't have to do this. You can just scribble in you know, carrots or um, arugula or something like that. But then I know that I'm going to direct seed, I think this was carrots. So the next time 511, two weeks later, I'm gonna direct seed something else. And then two weeks later, I'm gonna direct seed, you know, so you, I can see where are my bed space is open, where it's closed, H means harvest. And then at the end of the season, you can see where I don't have anything planted there. I know, it, either it's too late to plant something or I, that space is available to cover crop. So planning is really easy for crops that take, that take a whole season to mature or, or that bear on the same plant throughout the season. So good examples of these crops include tomatoes, peppers, pole beans, things like that. Other easy crops to plan include longer maturing ones like onions, peas, storage beets, and storage carrots. So here's a detailed plan of a bed planted to tomatoes. So this is all, um, these are all paste tomatoes as far as I can, that's what I usually plant in the first row of each of the uh, nightshade section. So you can see they get transplanted, which is the T, on the week of 525. And then I can start harvesting. If you look 730, that's the first one that I can start harvesting. I think that's Juliet, which is a lovely paste tomato and it's pretty, it's a pretty early bearer. And then you can see by um, July, everything's bearing. And then I know by the end of October that frost is gonna hit them and I don't have any more bearing. I'm sorry I can't get this bigger because I was trying to minimize the slides. <clears throat> so now the difficult ones are the ones where you have to plan succession planting. So for example, 
uh, once you transplant a lettuce, it's usually read, ready to be harvested in 50 to 55 days. So you know you're gonna, it's gonna be three, three to four weeks in a six pack because I'd like to start seeds for transplant because it allows me to have closer success, successions. I don't have to waste time on germinating seeds. Or it tells you, um, you know, it just, it's just easier. So looking at this, I've got direct seeding, two different things. And then this is a carrot bed, it looks like. I know one of my helpers is on the program listening. So she would probably be better correcting me. And she knows a little bit more. I'm a little flustered about that. But <clears throat> These are the ones that you want to have a constant supply of through the summer, but they don't take a lot of time to grow. I said mentioned radishes, I've mentioned lettuces, but it's also radishes, Asian greens, bush beans, and salad turnips. So to plan these sections, you need to be, become familiar with a concept called days to maturity or DTM. And whether that's calculated from the date of direct seeding or from into the garden bed or from transplant of the plant as a seeding, as a seedling. Uh, seed catalogs will give you this information. Johnny's catalog is particularly good, but you have to make sure you understand whether the day to maturity is from transplant or direct seeding. That gives you an idea of how long that plant needs to be in the ground. The difficulty is, is when you have, um, we have such a range of temperatures. So it will take longer for a lettuce to mature in the spring than it will in the summer. So you have to make those allowances. And those are the kinds of things that come with experience as you grow more. Um, it doesn't look that much different on this, but there's a lot of stuff going on here. So as I said, I showed you the detailed plans tell you when you need to do something like direct seed or transplant or harvest or pull or sow something else. So it's really important to remember that each plant has a best time to be planted. Plant too early and the plant could be killed by frost or just refuse to grow according to your schedule or plant too late and the plant either won't have enough time to produce mature fruit or it'll be affected by too much heat. So if you're starting to seeds in store, ugh, seeds indoors, you also need to know when to start them so that they'll be ready to be transplanted. And it's really frustrating for me to see people starting all their seeds at the same time when they should be starting them at, at the appropriate time instead. So I mentioned that I start leeks and onions in February or early March so they can be transplanted out as soon as the ground can be worked. Tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant really don't have to be started until late March. They'll be ready to pot on the last week of April or first week of May into larger pots, and then they're transplanted out into the garden the last week of May or the first week of June. So tomatoes go in first, they're a little tougher, then peppers, then finally the eggplants. There are a lot of seed starting schedules out there on the internet. Uh, Gene English has a really good one online. Mafka has some great ones. Johnny's will give you some information. Some of that sometimes you have to sort of figure out from the seed catalogs. Be very careful you don't get a seed starting or planting schedule for Virginia or New Jersey. It won't work here yet, maybe in 20 years, but not right now. So, and you'll learn. And this is important for keeping notes to remember that, oh yeah, I shouldn't plant those eggplant. I sh oh, it's 80 degrees in March. I shouldn't go and buy that tomato seedling and put it in the ground because we're gonna have a big snowstorm in April. So, and then using these plans, I make much more elaborate lists of things that when things will need to be seeded, transplanted, direct seeded and harvested. I have separate sheets for all of that. You won't need to have that much as a home gardener. So I'm not going to really go into them, but you can have little scribbled notes and that's effective too. You might have a page for each month or a page for each week and make a note there like check tomatoes for ripeness or check, uh, make sure this is going on or that's going on. So when I actually do the planting or transplanting, I make an as planted plan 
which helps me adjust my other plants as necessary. So then after I've planted or transplanted, I make a rough drawing in, of that part of the bed, and then I transfer it to a formal record. Um, in case you're wondering, the, little, the darkened area on the end of each bed is where I plant alyssum, and you'll see that later on. So I never plan to plant that to anything else. Another record you can keep is a list of what you harvest and when, and which bed it came from, and your yield by its weight and the number. So for example, um, we'll, we'll weigh a, head, a cabbage head. We won't weigh each individual cherry tomato, but we'll say 18 cherry tomatoes weighs eight ounces. So that helps keep track of whether um, the variety is a good one and is as productive as you like, or, um, or if your for soil fertility is declining. It's an, it, these are important things to keep track of. So you're also gonna to wanna to keep track of a log of your work. So this is my daily log for last <clears throat> November 13th. And I do list the things I do for the family. So yes, buy wine is an important, is an important thing I did that day. Um, <clears throat> but you can see I list uh, OBS is what I do with the farmer for my business. So mulch garlic beds, I put the snow fence up, we cleaned up the rhubarb, we cleaned up the herb bed, we mulched the sage, thyme, and lavender. We brought some of the stuff home uh, from the farm and we harvested beets and turnips. And then I kept my crew who was on my crew that day. And then I list the weather. So that day it was in the forties. It was overcast, colder than the day before. There was rain in the late afternoon and evening. So that helps you keep track of what's going on. And you know, you, this is where you'd say, first frost or first light frost or black frost. Yay, the week, the year is done. So during the growing season, I keep plans and records with me at the farm in file folders. And at the end of the season, they go into loose leaf binders for easy reference. You can just as easily keep a spiral notebook or something similar, but it's easy to look up something later than to try to remember it. So. Yeah, this is a lot of records, but you know, you're not starting 4,000 seedlings every year. So you're not gonna have this one. One nice um, binder for each year is a good thing to do. So planting records are really, are an important tool for keeping track of your crop rotations, which is my next subtopic. I hope everyone is familiar with this concept which basically involves moving families of plants to different garden locations every year in order to confuse plant pests and diseases. It's an important part of integrated pest management. Related plants often attract the same insect pests, diseases, and fungi. Moving them helps prevent these diseases from becoming established in the soil, and makes it harder for their particular pests to find them. In addition, crop rotation allows you to prepare your beds properly for the next group of plants because some plants need a lot more nutrition than others. Some, some plants like more nitrogen for fertilizer where a flowering plant doesn't want a lot of nitrogen. And it helps to irrigate more or less depending on the particular family. Cucumbers, need, cucumbers and onions and carrots need a lot of water. Tomatoes need a regular source of water, but they don't need water every day. So there are also some vegetables that benefit from being planted after others. And there are some vegetables that make it tough for plants to flourish the next year in the same area. So it's important to keep track of that stuff. So here are my rotation, my vegetable rotations. Root, root, excuse me, rotation one is a catch-all, unfortunately with alliums, which are onions, leeks, and scallions, cucurbits, the summer and winter squash, cucumbers, carrots, lettuces, melons, and watermelons, other salad greens, and things like that. I would like to break this rotation up a little bit more because I run out of room in my areas for it. Rotation two has all the legumes, peas, beans, fava beans, edamame, things like that. Sometimes I stick other things in there, depending. Rotation three contains all the brassicas, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbages, kales, um, collards, cauliflower, pak choy, Chinese cabbage. 
And then I also include in that beets, turnips, Swiss chard, and spinach. Rotation four is all the nightshades, potatoes, peppers, eggplant, and tomatoes. Along with some interesting things like cardoon when I plant it. So there are a number of ways this, there are a number of ways to do this. This is just mine. It gives you an idea, but it's something that you should think about. For instance, I wouldn't plant peppers somewhere where in another group, if you're planting tomatoes the next year there, because you'll have issues with that. So there are a number of ways to rotate your crops. The first is by planting related plants in blocks of beds, as I do. Then each year I move my groups of plants to the next block. So I do this because I grow so many varieties of the same thing. So in this, you can see those green signs and with the flamingos. And that's our little reminder of where the different rotations are. And in this photograph, you can see pretty closely all the rotations. So going from the upper right-hand side where the, you can see the pink streamers on the posts, that's rotation four. So that's tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant. Then down below that, as you can see the cabbages, kales, chard, things like that, uh, a Chinese cabbage, and you can also see a couple of succession plantings within that of broccoli. Um, so that's rotation three. And then across the aisle there is rotation two. You can just catch a peak of pea beds. And then up above that in the far left is rotation one. You can see the um, some succession planted uh, lettuces and then all the big onion beds. The other way to do it is to do it by bed, um, it, it, rotating each bed every year. This is one thing that someone like Elliot Coleman does or sections of big beds. You might research crop rotation and you'll find some interesting schemes there. Um, there are lots of ways to do it, but basically I've covered the high points of it. The next thing, one of the things I really wish I'd done with this, and this is an important thing for you to think about, I wish I'd done a five year or more rotation scheme instead of just a four year scheme. I would add a fallow year to your rotation where the bed or beds would be cover cropped to a green manure for a season with nothing else grown in them. Gives them a rest, allows them to regenerate organic matter and things like that. And we need to rely more on overall soil health rather than constant fertilization. So each section of the beds, as I said, has a different rotation each year. So um, sometimes I do, uh, I integrate things, for instance, up at the top, you can see the cucumber trellises and I plant summer lettuces underneath them, which keeps the lettuces cooler and makes them a little less bitter for the summer. So let's talk about plants that grow all season long or most or all of the summer and plants you should grow in succession. This is a photograph of my pepper beds, um, which I do stake and you can see the uh, a little bit of the tomatoes up on the upper left. Um, these are things that go into the ground all season and you harvest them continually. You're not pulling the plant, the plant stays in there and you take the harvest off of them. One of the things I do do with peppers, as you saw in the previous is, Peppers have two stages of ripeness, the green ripe stage, and then their colored ripe stage. The colored ripe stage usually comes about 20 days after the green ripe stage. So one of the things that we do is we take half of the plants in each variety of pepper, and we tie the pink surveyor's tape on the stakes. And that reminds us to save those green peppers to color up later on. For the life of me, I do not understand why people will not buy a green pepper at the farmer's market. We laugh about it. Um, they, they much prefer a, a colored pepper. Um, so it's important when you think about your cropping, think about how much you, your family and friends will eat over the summer. And if you, what you can, and if you can and freeze, how much you wanna store for the winter. So one of the things I wanna talk about at the farm, I not only grow for the restaurant, um, I also grow for my farm share customers, my farmer's market customers, and my family. So I grow over 160 tomato plants at a minimum. 
you don't need to grow that many. You might want to grow a couple of paste tomatoes if you make sauce, a couple of slicers for salads and uh, sandwiches, and then two or three different cherry tomatoes for snacks and for fun. Tomatoes grow well season and you can harvest them for weeks, so it's one and done. Crops you should plan to harvest from the same plants all season or at the end of the season include, now this is a long list, tomatoes, peppers, eggplant, kale, chard, dandelion, pole beans, edamame, garlic leeks, storage carrots, storage onions, storage beets, parsnips, storage turnips, and rutabaga, winter squash, pumpkins, mini pumpkins, parsley, shiso, salt, wort, savory, many edible flowers like calendula, snapdragons, marigolds, leaf, fennel, and dill, which I do let go to seed at the end of the season. I do plant them in um, succession for dill for, the, for their leaves for flavoring. Brussels sprouts, potatoes, collards, and tomatillo, and that's just a few of them. Crops that grow for shorter periods of time, but still take at least two or more months of growth and production include peas, bush beans, cucumbers, bulbing fennel, sweet onions, broccoli, cabbages, cauliflower, and spinach. So many of these, like spinach, cauliflower, and peas, prefer cooler weather of spring and fall to grow. So I'll plant these during the shoulder, shoulder season. So as soon as my spring peas are done, I plant for my fall crop, a different technique of planting them. But, you know, I'll get two crops rather than 10 crops of lettuce. So then I make multiple plantings of the following, typically two or three weeks apart, all season long. And that includes fresh carrots and beets and, turn and salad turnips, arugula, lettuce, endive, frise, escarole, scallions, radicchio, radishes, Chinese cabbage, cilantro, basil, leaf, fennel, and dill. And it's important to remember, this is something that also people are confused about, that one planting of lettuce, for example, is not gonna last you all summer long. Here you can see two succession plantings of lettuce. The ones on the top are almost ready to be harvested. The ones on the bottom will be ready to harvest in a couple of weeks. And then there are even tinier ones and other places in the beds. Now I'm gonna to go to a gloss over companion planting. So one of the things, it's related to crop rotation in some ways because the theory is that some plants help others grow better either by interacting in the soil somehow or by repelling harmful insects. This is a very, very old gardening school of thought that hasn't been fully backed up by science yet, but many elements of it hold true, I think. So plus it makes your garden even more beautiful. It attracts pollinators and gives you interesting and unusual things to grow. So I integrate herbs and flowers into my vegetable plantings. The first thing I do is I plant alyssum at the ends of every bed. It's a beautiful way of visually tying together all the different colors and textures you see. Alyssum's inexpensive and one tiny plug makes a big plant at the end of the season. My bees love it and when I pull the honey, when they've been going into the arugula, the honey smells just, I mean, alyssum, it smells just like alyssum and it's divine. So the great thing about alyssum is it starts blooming early and doesn't stop until pretty late in the fall. And it's one of the plants most recommended for companion planting. So one of the fun things I do is I underplant my tomatoes, peppers, and eggplant with nasturtium. Nasturtium are super easy to start from seed or they can be directly sowed. And both the leaves and the flowers are edible and they come in some fantastic colors that really fire up the garden. And they're a com classic companion plant. I think nasturtium is a Latin derivative for stinky nose or something like that. Calendula and marigolds, other edible plants like flowers like snapdragons and herbs like basil seem to flourish near other plants or make their neighbors, neighbors healthier. A classic is basil planted with tomatoes, which is something I do. I put pots of mints between my pole bean trellises as mint is supposed to repel bean 
bean beetles. So the Japanese beetles love my Kentucky Wonder um, pole beans. I've never had any other pests in the beans. I really love zinnias. So they're supposed to repel Japanese beetles, nasturtium rep repel aphids, among other things, dill supposed to repel tomato hornworms, um, marigolds repel root nematodes, and all these are wonderful cutting flowers. Now there are trap crops too. So if you plant something like radishes rad near another crop, a root crop, they will lure maggots, root maggots away from cabbages, and they also attract flea beetles. Collards, while tasty in themselves, help attract cabbage worms away from other brassicas. So the best part of interplanting flowers and herbs in your vegetables is the beauty they contribute to the garden. When you're planting your garden, think about the interplay of leaf texture like alternating flat leaf parsley with curly parsley, as you can see here between the alyssum and the zinnias. Also consider the colors, a deep pink zinnia planted in front of an airy light pink or white cosmos is pretty stunning. And I try to keep cool colors with cool colors and hots with hots, but there's nothing sometimes like a rational exuberance. So they're also a great way to separate different succession plantings or sections of your bed. So I often plant marigolds in my cilantro beds. I don't, I wanted to go see that. I might have it later on. And I plant daffodils between my rhubarb and between the perennial herbs. I just think they're just really fun to have some life in the garden early in the season. So I like serendipity too. So Calendula is a notorious self-seeder and sometimes I just let it go where it lands. A few years ago, the pansies on the left came to me in a flat of alyssum and so it self-seeded itself around the garden and we keep them there. So each new seeding comes with a different color combination and it's always see, fun to see what comes up. Uh, then we have the uh, nasturtium popping up among the uh, the uh, onions, so going from rotation four to rotation one, a little bit of self-seeding going on there. Um, last year, I ran out of um, parsley for a client and we ended up buying some from a local nursery and they had inadvertently seeded petunias in with the other, the other plants. So it was quite an exuberant planting. It was a lot of fun to see what happens. Nature is pretty wonderful. So the other thing I want to talk about is for you to plant unusual varieties of vegetables, the things that you can't often find in the grocery store, colors, types. It's hard to find fillet beans, for example. There are two. There's yellow and a purple. That purple one, velour, is one of my absolute favorites. There's also a green. There are lots of green fillet beans, and the as a for crudite, you can't beat the three colors of fillet beans with a nice dip. Same thing with things like radishes, all the different colors. And there are so many different kinds of zucchini and summer squash and scallopini, the patty pans. People don't realize how wonderful they are to grow. Um, I like to grow bell peppers, but you can buy a bell pepper at Hannaford. So why not grow a purple one or grow a miniature one or something like that? So one of the things I really love doing is growing hot peppers. And this is just some of the ones that I've grown. Um, don't let anybody ever tell you that you get, can't grow hot peppers or eggplant in Maine. It's not true at all. You can grow absolutely fabulous ones. Um, they come, hot peppers are really fun. They, everything from the mildest stuff like Highlander or the ancho peppers to hot ones like the, the habaneros or the ghost peppers. I also like to grow um, eggplants as eggplant are really my favorite, favorite vegetable of all. And they come in all sorts of colors, shapes and sizes from the Asian ones like the, like the one Machio up on the upper left, um, the standard ones like Traviata, baby ones like Calliope, this, these sweet little egg shaped multicolored ones. And then the miniature Asian ones like Hansel up on the top right corner. Um, the other thing, cucumbers are really fun to grow. They are all different kinds. They're Asian ones, though they have to be trellised to grow straight. 
They're white slicing cucumbers and pickling cucumbers for variety in your canning. And one of my favorite cucumbers is a variety from India that turns yellow and then brick red on the outside and it's really great in martinis. Carrots too come in all sorts of colors, as you know. Tomatoes, cherry tomatoes do. And it's just really great to spice things up. Uh, originally carrots were all different colors, but then the Dutch I hear just concentrated on the orange ones. And now we're back to having fabulous colors like the reds, the purples, yellows, different colors of yellows. And then I especially love the little round Parisian market varieties, as you can see between uh, the standard carrot shapes and the cherry tomatoes. They're really, really fun to grow. Um, one of the things you wanna do if you're starting carrots or growing carrots is you, I recommend using pelleted seed. It helps them germinate and it's just much easier to sow them. So that's my little tip for growing carrots there. So one of my problems is I'm a lettuce-oholic. So I love it and I grow it in all shapes, colors, and sizes. I'm not that much fun, not that much of a fan of deer tongue varieties or iceberg types, but I really can't resist most of everything else as you can see here. Um, I grow about 20 different varieties, but not necessarily all at the same time. Lettuce is a cool season crop, as I've mentioned, and it can get bitter in the summer heat if you're growing a, a spring variety in July. Now there are a lot of summer varieties available like the summer crisps and the batavias, and they do not go bitter like some uh, lettuces do. And then you can see under the cucumber trellises, I've also grown some, I've also got some tiny, tiny lettuce or small lettuce seedlings getting ready to grow for the winter, for the summer, I mean, the heat of the summer. Um, but in addition to lettuces, you should think about growing other salad greens. I love escarole, frise en dive, Italian dandelion, beet green, Swiss chard in all its colors, mustards and Asian greens and radicchio. Look at those two, those two different varieties of radicchio there. They're just wonderful. Basil, saltwort, shiso, leaf fennel, edible flowers, all those make great salad additions. So, and don't forget about vegetables like bulbing fennel, cardoon, and artichokes. This is, card, this is cardoon growing. Don't eat this raw, um, but it tastes a lot like artichokes and it is the cousin of artichokes here in Maine. They require special treatment for the seedlings. You won't get a big yield, but it's really fun and it's quite an ornamental plant. So, this is the beauty of starting your own seeds or buying transplants from an adventurous gardener or garden center. Look for the things that you want to eat that you can't find in the store. So finally, talk about cover cropping. Over the years, I've become more and more interested in soil fertility and how to enhance it rather than spreading expensive fertilizers on the ground. Cover cropping early and late in the growing season or over the winter or during a fallow year, as I've mentioned, is a really great way to add to your soil's tilth and its fertility inexpensively. In addition to helping to suppress weeds, a cover crop can help retain topsoil in your beds and it adds organic matter when it's tilled into the soil. Tap-rooted cover crops like the clovers help bring up new micronutrients from the subsoil and help prevent soil compaction. Many other cover crops attack, attract beneficial insects, pollinators, leguminous cover crops like field peas, the clovers, and hairy vetch also help fix nitrogen in your soils. So each type, each type of cover crop has a particular time for best sowing and has best uses. Many are multi-purpose. The clovers can be sown in your paths to help suppress weeds. They can also be undersown as a living mulch underneath some veg other vegetables. So I think some of the easiest ones to use are the clovers and the fall and spring manure mixes from Johnny's. I also like to use common and holeless oats because they'll be killed by winter temperatures, but their roots will remain in place to hold the soil over the winter. So here you can see a couple of different varieties of um, cover crops I've been in various stages of growth. The one in the center is one of the manure mixes from Johnny's, which will have uh, field peas, hairy vetch, and rye 
Um, there are oats and a bunch of other things in here. The important thing, you know, you can cover crop in a small garden. It, you won't be able to use a tiller or a big tractor typically unless you're doing rows like this, but you can till them in by hand, which is something that we often do. Um, and it's kind of fun. It's really great exercise. You can see what's going on in your soil. Look at, the, look at that soil there on the left and how beautiful it is after the rye's been grown. One of the things you don't want to do is let the cover crop go to seed, which is what we did here in between these two beds. You can see that the rye has taken over the path and that's going to make a little bit more work for um, that made a little bit more work for us this, uh, this past year. So I often do is once I, um, one of the things I do to control the seeding is I'll just run the lawnmower down that path, uh, right on top of the bed and it cuts the, the cuts the stuff. And since I have a mulching mower that will mulch all of the, um, all of the leaf, leafy material on top of the bed where it can be tilled in and where it'll de decay. Um, you want to do a couple of tillings a week or so apart and you want to make sure that the root, the cover crop has uh, degraded enough and rotted enough that it won't compromise the plants you're going to plant in there um, following the cover cropping. So it's an easy, um, if I'm concerned about soil compaction, the one thing I will do is get my nifty, one of my nifty garden uh, forks or a broad fork, and I will go down the bed methodic methodically, stick the tines in and wiggle them back and forth a little bit. That just aer aerates the soil, kind of like walking on your lawn in high heels. Um, so I've talked about a lot of things tonight, and I'm sorry there isn't time to go into more depth on these topics. And each one of these could fill an entire hour of our time. So I hope your interest, interest is piqued and that you'll go on and try some of these ideas and read up on them and others. Make sure you read a lot, read all the different things available and make sure you go and visit gardens. And the Belfast Garden Club has a really terrific summer um, garden tour series where every week you can go see a different garden. That's a wonderful way to see what more experienced gardeners are doing. So um, I'd love to answer your, any questions you have in the time remaining when I'm done. But if something occurs to you later on, or you'd like to share with me techniques and ideas that have worked for you, I'd really enjoy hearing from you. So please feel free to contact me by email. And if you'd like to visit the farm, I'd love to show you around. It's important to contact me first because I'm there and I'm not there. It depends. Sometimes I'm at the farmer's market or something. So um, I don't know how good it's gonna be this summer with no crew. And as I start a couple of new projects for clients and a big new garden at my house, but time will tell. And thanks so much for listening to me tonight and have a joyful spring and summer. Thank you so much, Anne. We do have some questions for you. Okay, I'm um, gonna skip my wine. The first, okay. The first question is where do you source drip irrigation strips? Well, I think there are a number of companies out there. There's a good one called Dripworks, but I buy my stuff from uh, Growers Supply, which is a division of Fedco. On their website, they sell all the different pieces. You don't have to buy the starter set, although that's a good way to start. Now, irrigation systems like that are, you have to think about how you're gonna put them together. So, Think about it carefully and you have, if you have any questions, email me and I'll help you work it through your plans. But they're well worth the investment. Very good. Uh, someone commented on your reference to zinnias um, repelling Japanese beetles and she said the Japanese beetles destroyed her zinnias last year. They're a trap crop. So you, you, you plant the zinnias, that attracts the Japanese beetles and they won't go after some of your they won't go after your edamame. But you know, Japanese beetles are the kind of thing that you just, you know, it's a good, you go out in the garden in the morning with your coffee and a, and a cup of soapy water and you just knock those little 
jerks off into the soapy water. They're easy to hand pick. It's funny, they, they seem to be attracted to zinnias and I said the Kentucky Wonder pole beans and of course edamame, the soybeans, but uh, they're pretty easy to catch as opposed to flea beetles. Uh, another person wants to know if you ever use manure in your garden. I will, I will here at home because I have chickens and I have goats here at my house and I will um, compost that kind of stuff. I do like manure based composts that have that are made. I really like the Little River Farm compost. I like I used to use a lot of kinney compost. I find that that's heavy. That's a wonderful manure compost if you want to use, but I don't use any fresh manure. However, if I had a bunch of rabbits, I definitely use rabbit manure, but manure should be aged. The problem with cow and horse manure is that they carry a lot of seed. So they do seed, seed. So you, you definitely have to compost them to get rid of the seeds or you're just adding trouble to your, to your garden beds. Okay. Um, now, I didn't notice any row covers in any of your photographs. Do you ever use row covers? N no. Um, I don't use plastic mulches because I don't like that waste. I don't like um, using things that aren't reusable. The only plastic I like to use, unfortunately, are uh, six pack holders for starting, trans starting seeds for transplant. Um, they're difficult to carry over year, from year to year. I'd like to transition to soil blocks or paper pots or something like that. Um, row covers are very, very helpful. I like to see my plants. Unfortunately, I have a bad infestation of flea beetles at the farm, so they're already in the soil. So even if I put um, Rime or Agrabon over them, I don't, um, it, that doesn't really help. Um, I prefer to, uh, the only, flea beetles are really the only insect we don't hand pick. Unfortunately, I do use organic sprays on them and, uh, you know, organically certified sprays, the pyrethrins and azadiractin, that kind of thing. Um, we hand pick pretty much every other um, insect. Row covers will gain you five, uh, five degrees of warmth. Um, I've often thought about draping them over the poles for the eggplant to use. I do have some, I just have never gotten into the habit of using them. But in my new garden, I'm going to have a fixed raised bed. So I'm gonna put um, little brackets that I can put hoops over and then mm -hmm. use them there. But I think they're a marvelous tool. They are reusable. Um, you can keep them from year to year and they can make a real difference. Okay, um, someone asked if you could talk about soil amendments. In addition to cover crops, do you use food fertilizers during the season? I, when I talk about soil amendments, I'm talking about things like green sand, um, some of kelp meal, um, rock phosphate, things like that. I use a, a recipe for a organic fertilizer that's easy to make. It came from um, Steve Solomon's book, and I've amended it over the years. And I usually put that in the bed at the beginning of the season. We don't, when we um, transplant things like the tomatoes, onions, uh, peppers, eggplant, we will take kelp meal, uh, you mean fish emulsion or uh, kelp emulsion, mix stuff up and use that for a little boost to water when we water them in. Sometimes we will do, I'll do a foliar spraying, um, but I don't typically use a, a commercial type of fertilizer or anything like that. The exception might be when I plant tomatoes, when I like to put a little bit of a espoma tomato tone in the bottom of each planting hole. That seems to give the tomatoes a nice boost. Okay, uh, someone asks, how are your bids oriented? East, west or? Yes. East West, okay. They're, they they are East West, yeah. and what's really interesting about that is I I purchased a big greenhouse this uh, past year, and one of the things is how do you orient it? Do you orient it East West or North South? 
I think you can get away with doing either. The nice thing about a north-south orientation is both sides of the raised bed will get, um, get sunlight. In the fall and in the early spring, it's really, it's interesting that the south sides of my curved raised beds will not freeze as quickly as the north sides of the rate. Even that two inches of shade makes a real difference. So I think what is more important probably is the contour of the land. So where um, the, the land at the farm slopes north to south, I like to go across it to try to reduce erosion. Wonderful. I think the very last question actually is going back to the previous question about row cover. Someone asks, what about remay on brassicas? Oh yeah, to repel um, cabbage fly and stuff like that. That's a great thing to do. Um, they also attract flea beetles. So if you don't already have a bad flea beetle infestation, it's a really good thing to get the, the row cover on as soon as you plant a transplant. The, other, the only thing you have to worry about is um, pollination, but that can be, by that time, your plants are usually big enough. I don't really, we, I tolerate a lot of insect damage at the farm, um, probably more than we're all used to buying this perfect uh, produce at the supermarket. Um, and I think that's something we need to really think about. Is it worth that kind of thing? Barrier methods of control or things like diatomaceous earth are, are great um, if you can keep up on them and you do them properly. I'm pretty lazy and I, uh, I like to hand pick. I like to get, you know, take cabbage worms off and look for them. Sometimes they're, it's very, very frustrating, but um, I think barrier methods are a really great way to prevent insect damage. Okay, well, you have several wonderful compliments and, and thank you messages also that have come in. And we all thank you very much, Anne, for the presentation. Well, it's always delightful. I love the Belfast Garden Club. I think you guys are great. And it's always a pleasure to speak for you. Anyone interested in information about the Belfast Garden Club, by the way, can go to our website at belfastgardenclub.org. And just a couple of reminders looking forward to the summer, we will be having our annual plant sale down near the boathouse. It will be on uh, June 5th with a rain date of June 6th. And the annual summer open garden days tour is also ready to go, I think starting maybe late June, but that information also is on our website at belfastgardenclub.org. So thank you all very much for coming tonight. Unless Brenda has- Thank you very much and happy okay. gardening. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, everyone. I don't have anything else. That was lovely. So, so inspiring. Thank you. <laughs>